Praise the Lord, everybody. I'm getting, I'm getting the hand signs from the soundboard back there. It's time to, time to start. So, being the, I'm used to, yes, dear. So here we go. <laughs> oh, what a great day! What a great day to be in church with God's people. I'm expecting great things from God today. Uh, we have two of the best today, uh, Bishop First Service and Pastor Second Service. Uh, you know, you would have to, uh, you would have to leave here and go out into the other churches, the organization and stuff like that to realize um, actually right the value of who we have here. Uh, I mean, you get out, these are two of the greatest men uh, in the organization, preachers and respect and wisdom, and it goes on and on. Um, you know, I mean, like here, it's Bishop, you know, but you get out somewhere else. Do you hear that Bishop Mullins is going to be preaching this service or something like that? But anyhow, we got the best of the best. Didn't mean to embarrass you, Bishop, but... I just wanted to say that, that we are blessed to have what we have here, and we got each other, this, this church family. Um, of course, let's hope you haven't had to, you haven't been there, but if you ever need anybody, 99% uh, of the time, somebody's just a phone call away if you need help doing anything, you know, prayer, your car won't start, um, anything, but uh, anyhow. Help me sing today. Sing with me. Amen.
just a closer walk with thee. That's what we desire every day, to have a closer walk with, with the Lord. Um, seems like he's always there in your time of need. You can call on him. And he, he, there's things he probably does and takes care of us that we never even know. You know, it's like you're headed somewhere, forgot your keys, got to go back in the house, come back and get them. Uh, you're five minutes late leaving. You, I mean, you never know. You could have been in an accident if you had went ahead and left. Just the little things and all the red lights that I stop at. You just never know. It could be God. <laughs> That's my pet peeve. What every red light I stop at it. It catches me every time. Just as I get to they turn red. But <laughs> you never know. It could be, you know, it could be the good Lord just keeping his hand on you or testing your uh, uh, temperament or whatever. Anyhow. <laughs> Take this time to let you worship in giving with your Sunday morning offering. And as you return to your seats, greet somebody and uh, tell them it's good to see them in church this morning. Amen. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We pray your continued blessing on this service. Anoint Bishop to bring us the word. Anoint our hearts to receive it. Bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'm sure when my little girl sings it doesn't minister to me but it hasn't happened yet praise the Lord hallelujah I uh, appreciate the Lord today appreciate the goodness of the Lord for all that he's done I uh, <clears throat> was thinking as we took the offering this morning I'm hoping y'all can hear me out there I can't hear myself but that's okay I can live with that Y'all can hear me? Okay, good. I uh, reached in my wallet, got some money, put in the offering, and I I thought, Lord, it's been a long time since I reached in that wallet and there was nothing there. But my mind went back to when Sister Mullings and I first got married. She's never worked outside the home. She's been an incredible wife, mother, took care of the kids, and probably did most of the raising of them. She was a wonderful mom, great wife. In the early days, we didn't have a lot. We, uh, I think my take-home pay was $52, $53 a week. We got married. We lived on that. Uh, we'd pay our tithes, give offering, pay what bills came out of that week three or four dollars worth of gas in the car and you gotta understand that would buy about 10 gallons back then we kind of had it measured out that we knew about what we'd have to have before the next payday and then with what was left we'd go to the grocery store and we had a pad and a pencil with us and everything we'd buy and we didn't always get everything on the list because sometimes the figure reached the amount of money we had in our pocket and so we'd buy that you'd be amazed at how many meals you can make out of two one-pound bags of spaghetti noodles and a half a pound of ground beef. Uh, I remember one time word came back to me that my aunt had commented how sorry she felt for my wife because I never gave her any money. She never had any money to give. <laughs> Neither one of us had any money. somebody the other day I said people always talking about the good old days haven't spent enough time in an outhouse in January lately that's all I got to say amen and I uh, I don't want to go back there but there was things that were better back then we we relied on God more than we do now I'm, I'm embarrassed but we had to we don't have to rely on God for everything now hello the car breaks down we don't have to pray that God can fix it and we've done that before you say oh we prayed for cars and God fixed them I don't know what he did but they started running again we don't have to do that anymore we go to the garage and pay the mechanic to fix it no 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 you know what I'm saying <sighs> but I need the Lord today and whether you understand it or not you need the Lord today if you have your Bibles this morning, I want to go to Job chapter 23, and then we'll go to 2 Kings chapter 2, share with you just a few verses of Scripture. Uh, I know by the markings in my study Bible that I have spoken from this setting before. I'm not sure exactly if it was like I'm going to do it today, but I know I've been there, so if I make comments today you've heard before, well... Maybe God thought you needed to hear it again. Job 23 and 1. Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. Here's a man facing the greatest crises of his life. And his commentary is, man, if I just knew for sure where God was at in this, if I could just find him, come before his seat. 
I, I already, I've already got my, I've got my argument all laid out. I, how I would appeal to him, how would I approach him? But, but I just knew where that I could find him. Then in Second Kings chapter two, Elisha has followed Elijah. He has been promised that if he sees him go away, he'll receive a double portion, or at least he assumes that that promise is given to him. He's been very diligent, very committed, and uh, he's followed Elijah. Even when Elijah tried to discourage him, tell him, wait here, I'll be back, he said, no, no, it might happen while you're gone, I'm going with you. And so the chariot of fire descends and catches Elijah. And the Bible makes the statement that he caught him out of his sight, which meant in Elisha's mind, he didn't see him go. And as he stands there, not knowing what to do, the mantle of Elijah comes wafting back down to earth. And in 13, verse 2 of uh, chapter 2, 13 of 2 Kings, and he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. Lord, help me today. I, I just want to talk to you for a little while about just seeking for God. Everybody say praise the Lord. Bless you. You may be seated. I read to you the accounts today of two men in crisis, two men that needed God. Both of them had arrived at, at perhaps the climactic moment of their lives. Job's faith, trust in God is being tested to the utmost here. He has been stripped of everything in life, his wealth, his health, his children. The only thing he has left is his wife and his trust in God. Elijah has come to the point where his mentor has been taken away. And, and hope against hope that he would see him go and receive a double portion. Uh, you, you may contend for your point of view, but the Bible very clearly says that the chariot caught him out of Elisha's sight. And so maybe he did, maybe he didn't see him go. But he, he is still at that crisis moment in his life. And, and both of them posit the questions that where is God? If you are here today and have lived for God very long and have never gone through a circumstance or a situation or a climactic moment in your life that has caused you to look around at your surroundings and your situation and the adversities that you're facing and seemingly the lack of answers that you have to the dilemma and you have never at least in your mind you may never have vocalized it but in your mind in your heart in the honesty of your spirit you've said where's God you are a unique individual indeed in fact I'm not sure you're totally an honest person if you say that's never happened to you in our lives today, there, there are some of you in this building, and there's not a lot of us, and that, I think that's sad, but it is what it is, and I thank you that are here. But in a, the 11 o'clock service, there'll be substantially more, and, and, and in the lives of us and some of those people that were there will be circumstances not entirely dissimilar to what these two men were facing today. And, and just in our surrounding environment and atmosphere, it is a... It is a, a totally adversarial environment for a child of God. Atheism, humanism, wars, immorality, amorality, and, and not just in your neighborhood, not just on your block, but at the highest levels of leadership in every aspect of our life. And they are not simply there, but they are flagrant and they are unrepentant about it. And our world entirely, the whole world, is reeling and seeking direction, even though they don't realize that that's what's going on. And, and then you add to that that some of us have personal perplexities that are 
that are worse than these. And, and the scary thing about that is our personal complexities carry eternal consequences with them. And there comes a point, I have an incredible lady that I've lived with for 53 years. I have some the most profound friendships here in this church that a man could ever hope for. I've got, I've got family. I've got the neatest gal that a man ever had for a sister sitting back there. I think I could talk anything over with her. I've got uh, different friends. And, and yet there are times that my perplexities are such that in the honesty of my heart, I really don't have anybody to commiserate with me but God. And I have been to points, if you've never been there, I envy you. I know I shouldn't, but I do. But, but I have been to places in my life where, quite frankly, I've just stood back and I've looked at my dilemma and, and I've thought, God, where are you? Where is God? How do, oh, that I knew where I might find him. I've got my argument all laid out. I've got my, my, my petition. I can, man, it's drafted if I just knew how to get to him and share it with him. And, and I've been to those points that, God, if, if I don't get something new and fresh pretty quick, uh, I'm not going to quit, but I may stand right here and die. I, I need something. And uh, in 27, one of Psalms, David said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. I think all of us would agree that that's our testimony. That's, that's, that's where we feel. That's what we, we but, but the problem is, I know he's my light and my salvation, but the perplexity is sometimes I just need to know how to get to where he is. And it's not always such a simple thing due to the fact that my humanity gets in the way sometimes. Sometimes... My problem is I've been like Jesus' earthly parents, Joseph and, and Mary, if they've been to Jerusalem for the, the Passover in and, and Luke 2 and 44, they have left and they've started home. And, and the Bible said, but they supposing him to have been in the company went a day's journey. And then they sought him among their kinfolks and their, their acquaintance and they looked for him and he, he was not there. And, and the, in panic, they begin to seek him and and the problem was they they supposed we all sometimes battle carelessness and apathy in our walk with God it, it becomes a, cub, a, a custom it becomes a habit Maddie it, it, it becomes something we do we come to church on Sunday and and we grin at each other and we smile and we sing songs about the goodness of God and and we know our lesson, and we amen at the right place, and, and we even enjoy the preaching, and the Holy Ghost moves, and we get the warm fuzzies, and, and that's all good and well, but all the time we're here, we're really careless, sloppy with our worship, sloppy in our approach to God, and, and uh, we're here, but we're not. Our heart sometimes is already packing for to leave on vacation tomorrow or whatever, but, but there's a, there's a, we assume that everything's going to be okay, and and here it is with the parents of Jesus, and they, they realize after a day's journey that he's not with them. They've, they've left him somewhere. And so among the kinfolks and those traveling, they look, and he's not there. And so they go back to Jerusalem, the last place that they saw him. And, and apparently the Bible says for three days they, they look for him until finally they find him in the temple, uh, confounding the wise men. And, and they begin to uh, reprove him and say, what what?" Do you know what's been going on? We've been anxious with worry. We, we've been perplexed. We've been looking for you. And we've been kind of like, Job, oh, that I knew where I might find him. And, 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 and Jesus just kind of innocently looks at them and said, and he said in Luke 2.49, how is it that you sought me? And in fact, in the original writing, it, he didn't say, how is it that you sought me? He said, where were you looking it's a good question. I mean, Brother Mike, where would they think they would find Jesus? I wouldn't have started at the bazaar. I wouldn't have started at McDonald's. If I was looking for Jesus, you know where I would have started looking for him? I'd have started looking for him in the house of the Lord. He said, where were you looking? You say you couldn't find me. You, you were looking. Where were you looking? Hello? Hello? shouldn't have been hard 
shouldn't be hard for us, it seemed like, but sometimes it is. Now, I know in the past, it's easy to find God. I could find him in the ark with Noah and his family while the rains fell and the floods raged. I, I could find him on the road with Abraham as he sought for a, a city whose builder and maker was God. I could find him with Daniel in the den of lions. I could find him in the fire with the Hebrew boys. I can find him in the prison with Paul and Silas as they sang and praised God. And I can find him on the Isle of Patmos with John the Revelator. Not hard to find God in the past. It's not hard to find God in the future. In the future, I can find him on clouds coming in great glory. I can find him sending one angel to bind the devil and cast him into the bottomless pit. I can find him sitting on the throne as we gather around the throne and cast our crowns at his feet. In the past, God never suffered any surprises. He was never caught off guard. His nerves were steady. His judgment was perfect. The future is settled. There are no gray areas. He has declared the end from the beginning. But my problem is I don't live in the past, and I don't live in the future. I live today, and, and I need to find him. I am perplexed. I'm troubled. I'm beset on every side, and I'm looking for answers that I don't have. And my petition is, oh, that I knew where I might find him. I'm like, I'm like Elisha. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Well, there's answers for that. The first place you can always find God <laughs> is in the Bible. John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. You know, one of the most neglected resources at the average Christian's disposal is the Bible, the Word of God. We come to these perplexing times and we wrestle against things we can't find answers for and we're, 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 we're lamenting, oh, that I knew where he was and, and he is his Word. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and, and the Word was God. We are a people of the Spirit and that is a great thing and I love to see an operation of the gifts of the Spirit and, and I wish we saw more of the operation of the gifts of the Spirit and, 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 and we need that but, but very much of what we do in our, in our living for God we do through, it, through our feelings and, and the problem with that is I am made in the image of God. That's not just my physical person, my emotion. My spirit is made in the image of God. And so, Brother Keith, there's a very fine line between my spirit and the Holy Spirit. And sometimes the only way that I can know which spirit I'm operating in is to try that spirit, like the Bible says, and take it to the Word of God and see what the Bible says about this thing to see if I'm operating in my spirit or in His spirit. And everybody said amen. Thank you. I can amen my own preacher, but I'd like to hear you say that. In the history of God's people, when they came to crisis moments, when they, when they came to dilemmas, when they said, where is God? They, they received a word from the Lord. And, and those that survived, uh, they, they, they made calculated decisions. Based, their actions were based on God's instructions. They 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 did their their doings were very deliberate. They were they were premised on on the word of God. When God came to Noah and said, "I'm going to send judgment on the world, but I'm going to give you a way to escape," He said, "I want you to build an ark." And He didn't leave him there. He didn't just say, "Go build a ark." He gave him exact dimensions, brother Charlie. He said, "It's going to be this long. It's going to be that high. It's got to be made out of gopher wood. It's going to have one window. It's going to have one door. It's going to have this and that and the other." And he did it exactly like God told him to in his word. And when he did it and the rains fell, it all worked out okay. Now, you've got to understand, well, you say, yeah, but Noah had, Noah didn't have a clue what was going to happen. He didn't understand what God said when he said it's going to rain. Genesis 2, 6, that there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the earth. Noah had never seen rain. He didn't know what rain was. All he knew was that it was going to be a dangerous thing, and if he was going to survive it, he better build him a boat. And God said, here's how to do it. And you know, we have a resource, folks, at our disposal. It's not a decorative piece for the coffee table. 
It's not a prop that you carry with you to church and lay it in your seat beside you and pick it up and take it home and lay it where it'll be easy to find the next time you need a prop to carry to church. It is the Word of God. It is our counsel. It is our instruction. It's our roadmap to heaven. In times of perplexity, when I don't know what the answer is, God does know what the answer is. And, and, he, and He's given most of the time already in His Word to us. Romans 10, 17 said, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of the Lord. The problem is eleven six of Hebrews said, Without faith it's impossible to please God. That's why David said, Thy word, O God, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In times of spiritual flux, and I'm sorry, I feel like I'm about as spiritual as the next guy. I feel like I pray about as much as the next guy. I feel like I know about as much as the, the Holy Ghost is. I'm arrogant maybe, but is anybody in here? Me and God have been going steady for a long time. We've been through some tough times together. A lot of times I've been lifted on the wings of His Spirit. I understand some things about the Spirit of God. But Sister Evelyn, there have been a few times in my life I couldn't find the Holy Ghost. It seemed like God was playing hide and seek with me as far as the Spirit went. And in times like that, I go to the book and I get my instruction because I know that I'm of God. The Bible said, you're of God, therefore you know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And so the word of the Lord is going to guide me and direct me through this dark hour until the light shines back and I feel the, the warm fuzzies of the Holy Ghost again. But David said in 119.89 of Psalms, thy word, O God, is forever settled in heaven. When you're going to make your stand, make your stand premised on the word of God. That's why in 119.11 of Psalms, David said, Thy word, O God, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The word hid there comes from a, a, a Greek phrase which means to make something a, a caretaker or an overseer. He's not just talking about I've memorized the word. He's not just saying I can quote reams of scripture. He's saying, God, I have in my heart it's there and I've made your word the caretaker the overseer of my I've given it authority over my actions when I don't know what the answer is and I can't seem to push my way through the fog between me and heaven I'm going to let the word of God direct my steps and I know as long as I do that I'll be okay that's why in James chapter 1 verse 25 he said but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You know, one of the things that I think the devil has clouded the issue in many of our minds, and I don't know about you, but I'm feeling the Holy Ghost right now. I'm feeling no pain. We, we, we think that, that the truth is something we believe, and we must believe it. But John said, no, no, here's the real power of the truth in First John chapter 1, verse number 8. He said, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Something, the truth is not simply something we believe. John said, the truth is something we do. We do the truth. That's why when we say, where are you, God? He, he's... Many times he's trying to get our attention, saying, I'm, right here, I'm laying right here on your living room table. Just pick me up. I'll talk to you. I'll give you instruction. I'll keep you safe till the storm passes by. So we can always find him in his word. Another place that we can find God is in the preaching of the word. In the Greek, the word that is translated preach is the, is, is the word for gospel. So there's something about the good news of Jesus. That's why in 1 Corinthians 1.21, Paul said, It pleased God to choose preaching to save them that believe. I don't understand it, how that, that God can touch the frailty of a man's flesh and he can stand in his pulpit and I can be down and out and dragging bottom and, and the anointed man of God will step in his pulpit and begin to preach the word of God and somehow... That anointed word of the Lord that reaches inside of my being and takes a stranglehold on my discouragement and my despair and my despondency, and it just 
totally chokes it until I come to the point where I walked in the house of God down and out. Now before the preacher's ever through, I'm up and in, and God has done something for me, and, and he has instructed me, and, 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 and somehow in preaching, God has this ability of mixing the word of God with his spirit, and he channels inspiration into my heart through a vessel of clay. That's why I've told you before, Paul said sometimes in the spirit we speak mysteries. There's times that under the anointing of the Holy Ghost that, that a preacher will, will speak revelatory things that you'll never hear or understand any other way. That's why in 1025 of, of Hebrews, the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. It's more important, and, and, and someday people are going to realize how important it was. I and I'm not, I'm preaching to the choir here, I understand. But there are times I sit in this 930 service and I hear Brother Charlie teaching and I hear Brother Franklin speaking and Brother Smith speaking and, 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 and if it sounds, I hear myself sometimes, I realize some of the things I've said and, and my, I, I feel like weeping for those that aren't here because someday they're going to need what was preached here. And I got this crazy thing that I, I believe God believes too. I not only have to answer to God for every message I've ever heard, I have to answer to God for everyone I could have heard and chose not to hear. Well, hallelujah. And at many times you will find God in the preached word, in the message, in the sermon, if you will. That's why the prophet looked to our day and he bemoaned the fact that in this day, People would battle a famine for the hearing of the word of the Lord. So you can find him in the Bible. You can find him in preaching. I'll tell you another place you can find him. You can find him in, in prayer. Matthew 7, 7, Jesus said, Ask and it shall be given. Seek, you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened. You know, our problem is we say, well, God knows what I have need of. Yes, he does. That's true. He knows all things. God knows what you have need of. But I've said this many times, it bears repeating today. I, I don't offend anybody, but God never meets anybody at the point of their need. God meets you at the point of your desire. If God met people at the point of their need, everybody would be saved. Because everybody needs to be saved. Second Peter 3, 9, he's not willing that any should perish, but all that comes to repentance. But there would never be any sick, because all the sick people need to be healed. Hello? But the Bible says, ask, seek, knock. That's God's plan. Deuteronomy 4, 29. He said, the day you seek me with a whole heart, I'll be found of you. Sometime God wants all of us. Love my kids. Die for any one of them. Little girl, your daddy's so proud of you. It's a good thing you don't understand. You could probably really manipulate me. But as much as I love my son, my daughters, my grandkids, I'm sorry. There's times I don't want to be around you. I just want mama. I want her all to myself. I just want some time with my lady. Sometimes God's that way with us. He said, I want you to turn everything and everybody else off. I want you all to myself for just a little while. Hello? I want you to ask and seek and knock. That's why Jesus said, and Luke, men ought always to pray and not to faint. That, that's, that's invariably the product of prayerlessness. Is we, we become fainting. We become weakened. It refers to our resolve. You know, I told you, when Sister Mullings and I got married, we didn't have a lot. Well, when I was a little boy, uh, we didn't have a lot. My, my sister grew up in a different house than I grew up in. There was a lot of years between us. My first day in college was her first day in kindergarten. So mom and dad were doing a lot better financially by the time she came along. When I, uh, we didn't have an indoor bathroom until I was six years old. We had an outhouse. We didn't have a refrigerator until I was eight years old. We had an icebox. And, uh, and uh, we didn't have, you know, when, when I was a little boy, you didn't, you didn't walk in the room and flip the light switch. There was no switches on the wall. There was a porcelain fixture in the center of the ceiling with a string hanging down. And when you got to be bedtime and you're seven or eight years old and it's dark in that bedroom, and I have never been afraid of the dark at all. I'm just afraid of what might be in it. 
and you stand there in the doorway with a, the light from the living room. You remember how the house was, Lisa, and, and that middle bedroom, that used to be the back bedroom, and that's where I slept, and, and it was dark in there, and, and you'd, you'd, you'd build your courage up, and then you'd, you'd go in that room like this, trying to find that string, and, and your courage would give out sometime. You have to run back where there was light, and, but I knew that I was never getting bad if I didn't find that string. So you just keep going. Some of y'all grinning. You've been there. You know what I'm talking about. And you go in there and finally you get in. And thank God that the, the switch hung right down by the edge of the bed. So once I got safely in bed, I turned the light off again. But you just, you just kept going till you got a hold of the string. And you know what? That's the way we need to be in prayer. Sometimes we, we'll go in there for a few seconds and pray and we don't find the string. And we say, well, God's not available. No, you keep building up your courage and go back and back and back until you find the string. Amen. And in times of trouble, don't forget to pray. First Chronicles 17 and 16, David has asked or he's told the prophet, I want to build a great house for God. The prophet says, man, it sounds like a good thing. But before he gets out of the palace, he stops him and says, no, go back and tell David. I said, no, he can't do it. Now, now, we know that God eventually told David, because you've been a man of war and shed much blood, and I want a man of peace to build my house, so I'm going to have your son do it. But God didn't tell that to David that day. And, it took, and for 17 years, it took for God to tell David why he told him no. And for 17 years, David just simply fellowshiped a no. But here's the key to his success. When in the most disappointing hour of his life, David King, the king, came and sat before the Lord. He was saying, God, I, I know I, you won't give me my wish. I know you're, but, but I don't think you'll withhold yourself from me. And so he learned the beauty of prayer. Fourth place, i got to hurry. You'll find God is on the battlefield, in the field of service. Jesus came to Bethany. Lazarus is dead. He's in the tomb. It's been three days. He tells the family, roll the stone away. They look at him and they said, God, we don't need proof he's dead. We roll the stone away. We'll smell the stink. We'll, we'll know. I know, we know he's dead. We accept that fact. We don't need exercise. We need a miracle. Now, sometimes that's the reason we don't pray and we don't worship like we should. And we, we come in here and we say, I, don't, I need a miracle, God. I don't need exercise. I don't need to. I need a miracle. God said, roll the stone away. They said, but you don't understand. We don't need activity. We need a miracle. He said, roll the stone away. Sometimes in, in, in seeking for God, the answer just puts your shoulder to the wheel and work for God. David comes into the camp of Israel. In the camp of Israel, there's doom and gloom. There's defeat. He goes out on the field and there's victory. The three Hebrew children out on the plain of Dura, the, the orchestra sounds. They don't bow. On the plain, there's uncertainty and there's fear. And then they're thrown into the furnace of fire. And once they get in the fire, God's with them. I don't know what it means, but when they came out of the fire, apparently God stayed in the fire. Hello? So well, sometimes we resent the... Sometime, Brother Mike, we might ought to spend a little more time in the fire if we really want to fellowship with God. And the fifth place, you can find him. You'll always be able to find him in Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Second Chronicle, Second Corinthians five nineteen, to wit that God, the Creator of all things, was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself. That's why Jesus said in fourteen six of John, "I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life." You realize that's just exactly the opposite of our way? 
That's one of the reasons why we, we have such problems sometimes really coming to Jesus. He said, I am the way. But the wise man in Proverbs 16 said, there is a way. He said, I am the life. Proverbs 16 said, that way seems right to man. I am the truth. I'm the life. But the end thereof is death. Jesus said, I am the way. Human reasoning said, there is a way. Jesus said, I am the truth. Human reasoning says, well, this seems right. God says, but I'm the life. Human reasoning leads, the Bible says, to death. That's why in Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so I close with this. Hebrews 4.15. For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us, everybody say us, say that includes me. Everybody said that includes me. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of Jesus. When I was a little boy, we used to have an old preacher that would preach for us once in a while. I was an African-American man. And when the Holy Ghost would really get to moving, the old man would kind of jerk and shiver a little bit, and he'd say, Thank God for Jesus. I know that's not theologically correct, but, man, it got the message across. Amen? It says it all. The songwriter said he's as close as the mention of his name. Everybody say praise the Lord. Let's be stand together. And, uh, thank you for your kind attention this morning. It's going to sound arrogant, but turn to somebody close to you, look them in the eye, and say, I got an idea you needed to hear that today. God bless you. In Jesus' name, take some time to refresh yourself. Let's come back in early and be in prayer. If you come back in, come in to pray. You're welcome to stay out there and just visit. There's a coffee room over here. But if you're in here, let's be praying. Amen. God bless you.